Welcome to Garden Delights. I'm Susan Howington, Family Consumer Science Agent with the Henry County Cooperative Extension, partnership with the University of Georgia. We have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about cabbage, and we're going to hear from Frank Hancock, our Agriculture and Natural Resource Agent. He's going to talk about gardening, as he usually does. He's going to talk about how to keep your gardening growing, and then we're going to make a wonderful recipe called Island Coleslaw. So I hope you'll stay with us, watch the show, and hopefully you'll have a new recipe to put in that box when we're done. We'll see you back in just a little bit. Welcome back to Garden Delights. As I was saying before, we're going to talk about cabbage and we're going to make a wonderful recipe called Island Coleslaw. But let's talk a little bit about the cabbage. You know, in our family, we try to eat cabbage probably once a month at least. And when we're putting our recipes together and what we're going to eat for the week, we always think about our Saturday night, what we're going to have green on our plate, and cabbage is always one of the top choices that we pick. And we all love cabbage. Now, when I grew up, the only way I knew cabbage was is when it was boiling in a boiler and you ate it sometimes very soggy, um, and uh, I learned to like it okay that way, but when I cook it for my family, we, we don't eat it that way. We do it where it's a little bit more texture. So when I get done talking about cabbage, hopefully you're gonna pick the way that you like for your family, but let's talk a little bit what, what's so wonderful about cabbage. Um, cabbage produces so many good nutrients for our body. So we really want to think about our fruits and our vegetables because that's where you are going to get the best for your body. Um, cabbage has vitamin A in it and it's very high in vitamin C. It also has iron, it has um, a little bit of calcium, it is fat free and cholesterol free. So if you're looking for ways to reduce that cholesterol, eat better in your diet, think about this cabbage. It's also very high in antioxidants in fiber and we don't get enough fiber in our diet, so cabbage is gonna be one of your top choices if you're looking for a way to get more fiber in your diet. Now, I talked a little bit about what's so good about it to eat, but let's talk about selecting that cabbage. And this is a wonderful head of cabbage that came out of someone's garden uh, nearby and uh, had a chance to share it with us. And when you're looking for cabbage, you wanna make sure that you're looking for, especially if it's a green cabbage, that the, the leaves look really nice. Um, they don't look like, you know, the bugs or anything else has been eating on it. So you want to look at your cabbage. You also want to make sure the leaves look really good and firm. And then when you pick that cabbage up, it wants to feel heavy to you. So that's you selecting it. So when you're selecting it out of your garden, you pretty much know what you're looking for out of your garden. But when you're selecting at the grocery store, look for the leaves, look for no pest on it, and then make sure it's heavy when you pick it up as far as the leaves go. Now, Cabbage can store in your refrigerator for about seven days. So that makes it really good because if you're not deciding what you want to do with it, you can keep this cabbage in your refrigerator for about seven days. Now, once you cut this cabbage, when the air hits it, once you cut it, it's going to start turning a little bit of brown or black on the leaves. And so you don't want to cut it until you know what you want to use it for. And once you cut it, it's going to average stay in your refrigerator for about two days. So Definitely don't cut it until you know what you want to do with it. So we talked about selecting it, storing it. Now let's talk about preparing it. You definitely have to wash cabbage. It grows on the ground, so you're going to have soil around it, so you want to make sure that you wash it. So that means when I are going to prepare this um, cabbage, I want to make sure that I am going to cut it, wash it, the leaves, make sure I don't see any dirt or anything else on it before I feed it to my family. And in cabbage, in the base of that cabbage, it also has a big core that you have to get out because it's very tough. So you want to make sure you cut that out once you're preparing your cabbage with your um, recipe. And then cabbage can freeze. You can freeze it, but it's a big but. This doesn't freeze very well. I'm going to tell you how to freeze it, but it really doesn't freeze very well. So if you're into wanting to freeze it, I am going to tell you how to do it. Um, you have to uh, wash it, like I said, to get it ready. And then you cut it in however you want to cut it as far as in wedges or uh, big pieces. And you're going to water blanch it for about one and a half minutes. So once you've water blanched it for one and a half minutes, you've got to cool this cabbage off 
to where it stops the cooking method. So you want to stop it as quick as you can. So you might want to submerge it in ice cold water and that's going to stop the cooking method. Then you want to drain it because it's going to be waterlogged. And so you want to get all the water off as much as possible. Then you can put it in your containers and your cabbage will store in your, fr your freezer. Now, when you take it out, it's going to be very limp. It's not going to have that crisp firm like when you do it for coleslaw or if you stir fry it and have that crisp um, to it when you're eating it. So it's going to be limp. It's going to have a little bit of water log. So you want to think about more like your soups, your casseroles, things like that to put this cabbage in once you freeze it. So hopefully from this you've learned a little bit more about cabbage what it's so good for you, um, how to store it, how to freeze it, how to keep it in that refrigerator up for that seven days and decide what you're gonna do in those seven days. So when we come back, I'm gonna make that island coleslaw and hopefully it's gonna be a recipe that you'll wanna keep for a long time. We'll see you back in just a little bit. Today we're going to be talking about cabbage and Susan is in there in the kitchen fixing up something out of cabbage. I just brought one of our, our spring cabbages here with us to just show you what they look like. If you didn't plant any, then you're going to have to wait till this fall. It's not quite time to get the cabbages in the ground, so, so but, but plan on growing some. That They make a, a great vegetable. I like cabbage. so. Um, Today is cabbage, but what I want to talk to you about for a little while is I want to talk to you about organic gardening. I get a lot of calls. I get a lot of calls from folks that want to know how to control the weeds and the insects in their garden uh, without using any harsh chemicals and that sort of thing. So organic gardening is a good thing, but if you want to do organic gardening, you're going to have to change your lifestyle just a little bit because you're going to have to spend more time in the garden. You're going to have to recognize what some of these harmful insects are, the timing of them. A lot of the organic uh, controls you have depend a lot on the timing of the application and that sort of thing. First of all, to grow an organic garden, you've got to work on developing your soil. You've got to have healthy soil. You have got to get some organic matter worked into your soil you got to have good tilth. We've talked about this in some of the other programs, but healthy soil will grow healthy plants and healthy plants will shed off a lot of, of insect problems and that sort of thing. The next thing you're going to have to do is select some plants that, that will grow with the insect pressure that you have. Some plants are so susceptible to insect damage that you just need to skip over them and find another variety that's not quite so susceptible so that you do have a means of controlling them. You're going to have to become knowledgeable about how many plants you can plant per square foot in your garden. The thicker you plant them, uh, the more weed control you'll have. They will shade out the weeds if they're planted the right thickness. Planted too thick, you won't develop a crop planted the right thickness, you'll help control weeds. You're going to have to work with cover crops. You're going to have to use uh, uh, cover crops. You're going to have to use mulches. Uh, some of the crops that you can plant, like hairy vetch and, uh, and sorghum, you can actually roll those plants down and use them as a weed barrier and plant your plants right in the, in the midst of them. You can roll down some, some hairy vetch and leave it on top of the ground and go right and set your tomato plants right in it. It will help control the weeds and, and take care of that. As far as insects are concerned, you got to get a little bit knowledge about insects. You've got to become a bug thumping, egg mashing kind of person. So when you walk through your garden and you see some eggs that have been laid on there by a squash bug, you're just going to mash them and get them off. Same thing with a vine borer. You just wipe those eggs off of the stem when you see them. So therefore, more time is going to be spent in the garden. You're going to have to identify your beneficial insects. Uh, you're going to have to be careful when you use controls not to kill any honeybees because you need all the pollinators you can get. What we've got here today is we're standing in a pollinator garden that's been put in to attract 
pollinators and beneficial insects. Uh, the, the patch that you see behind me right here uh, came from, from Johnny Seed. It's Johnny Seed's beneficial insect mix for the southeast. There are also other companies that, that make uh, different mixes that you can put in that are designed to, to grow flowers and things alongside your vegetable garden that will help control the insects in the garden. Some of them are attractant plants that will attract the insects to these plants rather than being attracted to your garden. So those are all tools that you have to use. Now, when you get in a situation where you need to use some control, I want to talk about two or three different uh, control methods that you have. There's a whole lot of them, but, but we don't have time to talk about all of them in great detail. But let's just talk about some of the more common ones. I'm going to walk right here to my, to my box and uh, we'll bring it back over here. Pyganic. This is a pyrethrin. Pyrethrins are, are the extract from a chrysanthemum daisy. Uh, so it's an all natural product. Uh, the, the, the compounds in it, the, the, the pyrethrins in that chrysanthemum will knock down insects and they knock them down really fast. They work on, the, on their nervous system. It is a short acting product. So you can go through and knock down the insects, but it's only going to be there for a couple hours. So, so you want to do it late in the evening. It also will knock down honeybees. So you don't want to do it in the day when the bees are working on the flowers. Try to keep it off of the, off of the blooms and just work it on the insects and, and spray the insects with it. You got to hit the insects with it. And it has a very short residual effect. Now the problem with it, it's not real strong. Some of the insects you knock down are going to recover from it here in a little while and get back up. So you have to con constantly be monitoring it. But this is probably one of the most commonly used products in the garden, uh, uh, pyrethrin. Insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soaps are made to control insects these are not dishwashing detergents. Dishwashing detergents have, have things in them to make your dishes squeaky clean, and you don't want your plant to be squeaky clean after you spray it with this. This has got to be sprayed on the insect. So if you're working on white flies and things that are underneath the leaf, you're going to have to spray underneath the leaf or it's not going to bother them. It has practically no residual effect. So you get it on the insect, it kills the insect, and and the next insect comes along, it doesn't bother them. It dries on the leaves. The disadvantage to this is there are some plants that are, are sensitive to this, and, and they have a reaction of wilting leaves or leaf margins, so you need to study the label, see what it's good for, what it's not good for, and then you also can do a little test sample about 24 hours before you get ready to use it on whatever plant you're going to use it on and make sure you don't have a, a, a reaction to it. But this is a good product that is very useful in controlling white flies and aphids and, and those kind of things. So another thing in your arsenal. Neem oil is another one that can be used to control some of these plants. It, it's uh, uh, also works as a fungicide. Neem, uh, one of the active ingredients can be azadiractin, but you can get neem that doesn't have any azadiractin in it that you'd use more as a fungicide. Azadiractin is the compound in it that, that controls these insects. Uh, we've got it here in the form of azagard, uh, so it, it has, it is as a direct, and so it's the insect control portion of it. Uh, again, be careful what you use it on, read the label, but, but these are both things that can be used organically. Um, you will see the, the uh, OMRI label on them. That's what you're looking for when you're looking for things approved organically. And uh, the next thing that gets used a lot is um, Bacillus thuringiensis. 
BT is what it's commonly called. You'll find it under the brand name Dipel. This is organicide worm and caterpillar control right here. So BT is a bacteria infection that kills soft-bodied insects. So this is going to take care of your of your caterpillars and those kind of leaf eating things that you get on your plant. It comes as a, a powder. In this case, it, it comes as a liquid. It can be mixed. This is a concentrate. So it can be mixed with water and used as a spray. Some people will take this and inject it in the stems of their squash so, so that they can uh, try to control the squash vine borers with it. Some people will inject it into the ear of corn to control the corn the earworms, those kind of things to try to uh, help control. So, so this is an organic compound. It's got the OMRI label on it right here, so it can be used in that regard. We talked about uh, the seeds. Uh, this is that pack of, of Johnny's beneficial uh, insect attractant mix. That's what's growing behind me here. Uh, a lot of it hadn't bloomed yet, but uh, these are things that you can get that people have already studied what insects they attract and they've put the package together for you. Something that came in the, showed up in my mailbox. I hadn't ever seen one of these before, but uh, Maybe I can get it out of here. This is a, a seed bomb. Uh, seed bombs have been around for a long time, but uh, this company, uh, Green Aid is the name of it, so they're calling this a little seed grenade or seed bomb. Uh, this particular one has got white yarrow, black-eyed Susan, and forget-me-nots, and it's, it's being sold as their pollinator variety. So. These come, uh, they actually, the, the company that does these actually puts them in gumball machines. So you can come put your money in the gumball machine and get you a, a seed bomb. And so these can be planted, you don't have to do any digging or cultivating or anything, you just throw them out where you want them. Uh, you know, if you got a next door neighbor and you don't like the way he's keeping up his lawn. You can launch a few of them over in his yard. He won't know where they came from and just grow some flowers. Vacant lots, a lot of people use them on vacant lots and you just, you don't have to ask permission. You just go throw them over the fence. And the ideal way to do it is to just get out your slingshot. And you just take this thing, put it in your slingshot and you walk up to the fence where you want to put this thing out and you just launch it and uh, walk away, go home. So uh, that's another method of getting some uh, beneficial flowers growing around the garden that may be a little bit more fun than, uh, than some of the others. And uh, that's about all we're gonna talk about today. Some of the things you can do organically to control the insects and to help try to control the weeds in your garden. But like I said when we started, if you want to be organic, you're going to have to spend a few more hours in the garden looking at what's growing out there and what's, what's good and what's bad and, and, and thump those bad bugs off. Okay, now we're going to go inside and see Susan and we're going to see what she's got fixed up out of our cabbage. back to Garden Delights. We're going to be making that island coleslaw and we have our cabbage already shredded in our bowl here and we have some pineapple tidbits and we have some romaine noodles and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to put into the cabbage part of it and you can tell that it has a little bit of the purple uh, cabbage and a little bit of the carrots in it also. Now I love the green cabbage but you know I love just mixing around a lot of times with the red cabbage so it's up to you as far as what you might want to put into the, the uh, cabbage mixture. It also requires to put in this recipe to make it this part of it is three onions. So I'm going to go ahead and chop the three onions and we're going to put those into the cabbage. So I'm going to go ahead and get those chopped up and I love green onions. Um, we grow a lot of these in our backyard 
And uh, when I'm getting ready to make, whether it's a casserole or stir fry or doing something like this with the cabbage, I'm always looking for a way to, to take a uh, green onion. And I love to do, go all the way and get parts of the green part of that onion also. And I'm just gonna take this and go ahead and put it into the cabbage, cabbage mixture. And um, I love to have just a little bit of that green part in it. You can see this already makes a pretty look just with the, the, cab, I mean the uh, onion into the cabbage. And then I'm going to go ahead and um, just put on top, I'm not gonna mix it yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and put the pineapple tidbits on top and just make sure that I get all the ingredients on this part. And then the noodles, as you can see, um, you have to crunch them up to make them work for this because what you're doing is giving a little crunch, good little texture to this coleslaw. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and put these on top. And we're not gonna stir it around yet because I have to make the dressing. So I'm gonna go ahead and make the dressing part. I'm gonna move this out of the way. And to make the dressing part, it, you can take any Tupperware dish, anything that you liked, um, just to shake it around because that's what we're going to have to do for this part of it. And um, we're going to end up putting on the coleslaw. Now, I will tell you this. Once we make this dressing, you want to make sure that you add the dressing last minute to it. So I'm going to take this to a church party or, or, or office party or whatever. I may have this already mixed up, but I'm not going to add the, the wet part of it and to the last minute because I want my noodles to be very crunchy when people taste the island coleslaw. So just remember that. So we're gonna make the dressing. This is a half a cup of vegetable oil or olive oil, whichever one you want to use. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour this in my container. And then we're gonna need about a third of a cup of vinegar. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour that into the oil. And we're gonna also need a half a cup of Splenda or you can use a half a cup of sugar. So it depends on what you wanna use. But today we're using the Splenda. And then um, on the noodles, I do wanna tell you this, I'm using the Oriental flavor ones and that's very important because the Oriental packet that comes with those noodles is what we want to use to make it have that wonderful taste it's gonna have, have with it. So what I'm gonna do now is open that little packet and go ahead and put that in there. And what we're gonna do is put the lid back on and I'm just gonna shake this around. And just we wanna make sure it's all incorporated together I want to make sure I have this lid on really good because um, you don't want it on your clothes. Now, if you stir it, you probably can do the same thing, but you want to probably make sure that you're shaking it because you want to make sure all of it is mixed up. And this makes a pretty good bit. So you do not have to pour all this dressing on here. Um, you can leave some behind and you can put it on your salad or your coleslaw the next day if you want to. So you could do this in half mixtures. Um, depending on your family, but this is going to serve about 12 people. So if you want to cut this in half, the recipe, and you have a smaller family, you can also do that too. Um, so I'm just going to make sure that sugar, the vinegar, and the oil, and that packet are all mixed in together. And that looks pretty good to me. And this is a really easy dressing if you're um, looking for something different, a little bit different taste. I'm gonna move these bowls over here to this side so we can get our bigger bowl into the center. So what I'm gonna do is take this and we're going to just kind of drizzle around and I'm gonna end up stirring it around as I do it. And like I said, you don't have to use all of it, but it does give a wonderful flavor, this coleslaw. So I'm gonna give it just about that much and we're gonna kind of start tossing it and we wanna make sure that we get our, our pineapples mixed in there also. So I'm just gonna get it, and you can see now that everything's getting a little wet to it. Um, so that means that the oil and everything's kinda of blending around. And I want a wonderful crunch to it when we eat. I'm gonna add just a little bit more after I've stirred that around. So I wanna make sure I have a good bit. This would be great on a sandwich you know, cabbage leaves are really big. They hold up really well. So you could even take a cabbage leaf and make you a rolled up sandwich um, and get all those wonderful nutrients that I talked about earlier. 
So just think about that when you're putting your menu together. Think about putting that coleslaw and think about what you can do with that coleslaw to make it even better. So even on a hamburger, um, and one of my favorite things is eating coleslaw even on barbecue. So, you know, there's so many ways that you could take this and eat it and enjoy it. So this is pretty much finished. Um, you can see a little bit about the pineapple in it. You can see a little bit of the noodles in it. Um, and it's going to be really tasty. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you're putting this oil and vinegar in the packet um, on at the last minute because you want to make sure those noodles are crunchy because that's what you're trying to get, that texture from that. So as you can see, we have our island coleslaw. And when we come back, we'll have Frank come and taste it, and hopefully he'll think it's as good as I do. We'll see you back in just a little bit. We have Frank with us, and we're going to try the Island Coleslaw. So Frank, I have put together some great coleslaw and I want you to be one of the ones that's going to taste it and tell me what you think about it. All um, right, my favorite part of the show. It's going to be hopefully a little bit of twist, something different, and hopefully you're going to like it. And, well, uh, let's see. See what you think. I'll get a little bit myself. So what do you think? Mm -hmm. That's good. Is it good? It's got a little crunch to it. It is. You know, I was a little concerned when I came in because there's no barbecue and no chicken. But this is good enough by itself. It doesn't have to be a side dish. Well, and that's, that's a good point because this could be like a whole salad where you could just eat this mm -hmm. and not worry about anything else to go with it. You're getting a little bit of green. You're also getting a little bit of fruit. So got of a little crunch to it. It's still the number one ingredient in a slaw dog. Right? You got it. You got it. So let's try it. That's pretty good, Frank. That is good. I can taste that pineapple. That's probably the best coleslaw that I've had. Well, I'm glad you like it. There's no barbecue and <laughs> no chicken wings. Well, next time we'll have some barbecue or chicken. Of course, for coleslaw, you. you know, slaw or cabbage in itself is it's going to be time to plant some in the next month or so you know, for the fall crop. It really is, and that's a good point. So be thinking about that when you're trying to put that garden together. Think about putting some cabbage in that garden. Go to the website and check out this wonderful island coleslaw recipe. Hey, we'll see you next time on Garden of Lights. See ya.